Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Here on Bloomberg TV and radio, I'm Joe Matthew. Indeed, Kaylee Lines is back with us today as we usher in the start of an important summit this week in Washington, the 75th anniversary of NATO. And Kaylee, we've been talking about this so much through the guise of Joe Biden's well-being. Mm-hmm. He's going to be speaking later today. We'll bring you that address, uh, of course, around five o'clock, at least some of his words to see how he's feeling and how he's projecting himself. But of course, this is a critical time for the alliance, Kaylee, to be meeting, not only because of Ukraine, but uncertainty throughout Europe following elections over the past uh, week or so here, and a lot of questions uh, about the future of politics here in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. These countries' leaders may also be bracing for the potential return of Donald Trump, questioning what that might mean for this alliance that now, of course, is much larger as it celebrates its 75th anniversary with the addition of of Sweden and Finland, of course, that we've seen under this administration. But you're absolutely right, Joe. We do expect that Ukraine will feature highly as well as mm-hmm. concerns about what Russia could do next that's if right. it indeed is victorious in Ukraine. And that's a concern that especially the Baltic states we know uh, very much have. And we want to bring in now a foreign minister from one of those states, Latvia, the country. Uh, Baiba Breja is with us now here in our Washington, D.C. studio. She is indeed the Latvian foreign minister. Minister, thank you so much for being with us here on Bloomberg TV. Thanks for having me. And radio. <laughs> Welcome to Washington. I'm sure it's going to be a busy several days for you. And what very are you hot ones. To, <laughs> and very hot ones, yes. What are you hoping to leave here with? What is your outcome that you were looking for from this? All right. So NATO is a defense alliance. It has a particular meaning. It's political military alliance, the only of its kind. So the primary purpose of that is, of course, the defense of allies. So there is a lot of change that is happening with Russia's attack on Ukraine. So we have moved from out of area operations where we had choice of sending people to Iraq, you know, for Mm -hmm. six months and then rotating them uh, again to a collective defense, back to collective defense, what we had in the Cold War times with General Eisenhower establishing the basis of that after the Second World War. So defending allies, having troops in place, having capabilities, having uh, command control in place, uh, ability to reinforce, and so on and so forth. So that's that package is the most important outcome. It goes hand in hand with support to Ukraine, obviously, because what Russia is doing in Ukraine is something that is considered a threat to all allies. Mm -hmm. So supporting Ukraine in its liberation fight is crucially important. They are fighting for freedom. That's what we all are there for. We all want freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So Ukraine, winning Ukraine is very important for all of us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, working with a wider range of partners from Indo-Pacific, for example. They will be here for the summit to address other challenges and threats, such as you know challenges from China, constant cyber attacks you would have seen, the trying to change the balance of power globally. Mm. So that is also important for all of us because it's not just about Russia's conventional war, it's also about the challenges mm-hmm. to all of us, to who we are and how we function as democracies. There's a conversation, of course, in Europe right now about levels of commitment when it comes to Ukraine, but also NATO more right. broadly as the alliance. Because of your border, you're on the front lines of protecting democracy as a NATO member. Do you worry about a fissure in European politics, having seen elections recently when it comes to this issue? Well, NATO has had a borderline with with Russia since it was established in Norway and other places. So now it's longer. Now it's Finland joined. The Baltic states have been uh, bordering Russia since we were established 105 years, 106 years ago. And uh, since we joined NATO 20 years ago, so we are all peaceful countries, but we want to continue being peaceful countries. So that's why we established that defense capability together with the U.S. And U.S. is an essential member of that alliance. So Mm -hmm. that link is crucially important. So, of course, we are interested in successful U.S. Of course, we have a share in U.S.'s concern, whether it's China, whether it's other uh, challenges that we face together. So... That's that's why we are together mm-hmm. here in Washington as NATO Alliance to address any threat to any ally. Well, it's you, though, a- among the allies that potentially are most immediately affected if Russia were to decide to move NATO. beyond Ukraine. <laughs> Na- but that 
Exactly. Article 5, theoretically, if Absolutely. Latvia or any other Baltic country, any country in the alliance were to be attacked, theoretically, that would trigger all of the NATO forces coming together in a, in a defensive way. How should we think about what that attack could actually mean, knowing we've seen hybrid attacks, cyber attacks, for example, Russia has been conducting in the region, and China. moving uh, China as well, moving buoys in the river that separates Estonia and right. Russia. How should we be quantifying what an Article 5 triggering event actually might be? Could it be something like that? So the important part is actually to have that situational awareness, which means to have the intelligence reconnaissance capabilities to understand the threats. That means both on the Russian side, but also globally. It's about terrorists, it's about uh, cyber attacks from wherever they can come. We have called out also Iran on cyber attacks. So it's important to have that situational awareness to be ready, because once you know what is happening, it's easier to respond. And this is where NATO together, we have invested so much. That's why we have that defense uh, growth in terms of defense spending. That's why we have additional defense capabilities, and that means expensive technology, mm -hmm. satellites. That means you know reconnaissance capabilities. That means drawing all the data together, working with the private sector, giving back to the private sector, private sector contributing to that open source awareness. So it's a it's a pretty complicated algorithm, but all together as the alliance, it's not about the Baltic states. It's about whole of NATO because we are in mm -hmm. it together. And once we, are, once we have that situation awareness, once we know what is threatening us or not, we are able to respond as necessary. So for now, there is no direct military threat to any of the allies because we have invested so much work to make sure that we have that deterrence capability. And deterrence is what we are seeking. Well, Minister, I know you're here to engage with the administration and your allies Correct. here at the convention center just a couple of blocks away from where we are. Uh, and you're not here to talk about Donald Trump, but there is a debate about redefining Article 5 right now if he were reelected. And he's called into question whether certain members would qualify for Article 5 protection based on their contributions. Are you concerned about or do you expect Article 5 to be redefined if... Donald Trump is real. No, we don't expect that. We worked very well with the Trump administration before, and uh, you know, it's a. It, we work with all the Does administrations, that just sound like and I don't recommend to any politician to comment on another country's internal yeah. politics. But uh, whoever is elected, we will work uh, with him, her, them, and. It's important for America to know that it has friends and allies. Mm. I mean, for all the countries, it's important to have those friends and allies. And there is no closer friend or allies at any country in NATO for, for America. And I think that's why also when President Trump was in power the previous time, it was very clear that there were all types of rumors that he would withdraw America from NATO and so on and so yeah. forth. Mm -hmm. But it never happened because at the end, we are better off stronger together. And as I said, currently the defense spending is at the rise as never before. Uh, 23 allies are about 2% of GDP on defense, and mm -hmm. it will be rising. Speaking of, of spending money on defense or other countries' defense, we don't only have questions about what this election means for potentially U.S. membership uh, in NATO, but also the amount of money the U.S. is going to be willing to continue to provide to Ukraine. It was very difficult for Congress to get the aid passed earlier this year across the finish line. If the U.S. could no longer provides that aid to Ukraine. What would that mean for, for other NATO countries if, if, if Ukraine is less in its ability to defend against the Russian invasion as a result? Let me be straightforward. I think that it's in the U.S. interest to provide that aid because most of the money, almost all of it, goes back into U.S. economy, in mm -hmm. the U.S. defense industry, sort of increasing its own capabilities, research capabilities. Also in terms of lessons learned from the war in Ukraine, it's both the war of the past, but also war of the future from what we are seeing with the drones, with targeting through mobile phones, with applications used for identifying the targets and so on and so forth. So I think all our military and defense industries are really working closely with Ukrainians to learn and prepare for those future wars that mm -hmm. we might be faced with wherever. We don't know. We don't know where it can arise. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, U.S. aid to Ukraine is a help to the U.S. itself to prepare for the future. Do you expect to leave this summit with a clearer path for Ukrainian membership? Listen, Ukraine is one of the strongest fighting forces in Europe today. I mean, it's a country, it's a power that has shown with the biggest army in Europe mm -hmm. 
that it's able to defend itself. Yes, with the Allies' help, obviously, and that will make NATO stronger. It will make America stronger once uh, Ukraine joins Should there NATO. be a timeline? Uh, possibly. Again, you know, it depends on the success on the battlefield. The sooner Ukraine is victorious and we can reach a deal mm-hmm. on on the end of the war, the uh, sooner we can sort of finish financing the war. But very clearly also then we can have a sort of post-war architecture uh, with Ukraine in it. But effectively, the war needs to end first before any of that. Ukraine can needs to achieve that victory that it has to define what is a victory. Nobody else but Ukraine has to define what is a victory on the battlefield. And we have to be there to support them to achieve that. What do you make of the conversation that we're having here in the United States about our president now, 81 years old, and questions about whether he has the mental acuity to continue, whether his counterparts in NATO? think that he should continue in the job? What's your thought? What does Latvia think Well, I met President Biden both when I worked at NATO and and I look forward to seeing him tomorrow at the summit. And uh, I wish at age of 81 I would be as strong as he is. (laughs) We all have our ups and downs, you know, at some moments, so I don't expect it to lead any kind of tragic outcome or anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, quite clearly, American democracy will be able to handle all the challenges and you will find the way through this or through other challenges. I don't Mm. doubt that and you will be as strong as ever and as powerful as ever. Mm. And so essentially what you're saying is the strength of the country is more about the country as a whole versus the figurehead? Again, uh, the figurehead is important, obviously. I mean, we all look up to we the President Biden the president or President Trump. We describe the leader Trump of the free world. Absolutely. So it's very important. Uh, but in the same time, obviously, we all have our ups and downs, and it's mm-hmm. we cannot predict when that happens. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't doubt that U.S. is as strong as ever. We'll be carrying his remarks when he speaks, uh, marking 75 years. What do you want to hear from President Biden later today? I want to hear that uh, America and the link with allies is as strong as ever, that we are as united as ever, and the strength and the belief in freedom and democracy both in Europe, in America, and support Ukraine is there. All right, Minister, we appreciate you joining us here at Bloomberg today. That's Latvia's Foreign Minister Baiba Braja here with us around the table and enjoy the remainder of your very hot time here in Washington. (laughs) Make sure to hydrate. We appreciate your time, Minister. Thank you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Coming to you live from Washington, which is a busy town, I must say, Hmm. this week. A lot of roads leading to the Bloomberg office here uh, Blocked off, closed. I think traffic was a nightmare this morning because there are a lot of important people in town, Joe, including the NATO (laughs) countries. There's more than 30 of them, and it's all teeing up a pretty big moment, or moments, plural, for President Joe Biden. Yeah, if you want some real elitist complaining here, you can't get around the nation's capital. It's brutal outside. It's also about 100 degrees if we put those two together. That's kind of the backdrop for this summit. And can we welcome Kaylee Lines back? It's great to see you. We missed you for the last week. Now that we get serious about some stuff here, this is an important moment. Joe Biden's going to speak around 5 o'clock, about four hours from now. Mm -hmm. That will be followed by his news conference on Thursday. The world is watching, not just Washington, and we'll bring you up to date on what's been happening on Capitol Hill earlier today. Let's bring in Nick Wadhams first to talk about what's behind this summit and what we should be looking for. He runs our national security coverage here in Washington. And it's great to see you back here, Nick. Uh, this is a big deal, 75 years. It's got a bit of a cloud hanging over it because right. of domestic politics, questions about Joe Biden. All of these leaders are being asked about their relationships with him, but also some of the uncertainty following elections in Europe. This is a peculiar moment for this summit. Yeah, I mean, it's the timing in a lot of ways could not be worse. I mean, this was supposed to be a summit that was going to be a celebration of NATO, talk about unity, project uh, a real show of force against uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, talk about the defense of Ukraine. And in a lot of ways, it's doing exactly the opposite. So you have a lot of concern about the long term viability of these leaders, obviously, Joe Biden over his age, but the fact that he trails Donald Trump so much in the polls. 
French President Emmanuel Macron made an election gamble that didn't turn out so well for him. He's looking hobbled. Uh, Germany as well, the rise of the far right in a lot of ways. So you have these leaders coming in where their focus really is elsewhere. And then underneath all of that, you have the fact that they can't agree on Ukraine. So again, we get into this dynamic where they're offering dangling the idea of membership at some point for Ukraine, but not giving a firm timeline on when that might happen. And that's the thing that uh, Ukraine really wants. And of course, Ukraine is going to make the case in person here. President yep. Vladimir Zelensky is in Washington mm. for the summit, if not an invitation to be a member. Can Ukraine expect anything tangible to come from NATO within the next few days? Uh, well, I think what you will see, we're, what we're hearing is that there will be an announcement around air defense. What they really want is additional air defenses. So maybe some more Patriots, um, a few more batteries, something like that. Um, and then a, a, a potential form of a longer-term commitment. But what we're not really going to see is anything that actually changes the situation on the ground that would allow Ukraine to expel Russian forces from its territory. Uh, we're going to see Ukraine basically be in a bunker mode. And so that's really the bigger question on Ukraine that hovers over this whole thing. Okay, you're going to continue flowing weapons to Ukraine, but not give them the weapons they need to expel Russia for good. Mm -hmm. So then what is the long-term end game here? Do you just keep going indefinitely? Something they have not been able to answer. Questions about, you mentioned air defenses, uh, the use of F-16s, mm -hmm. which we labored over for months, Nick. We talked to you about it. It was a no, then a yep. maybe, then a yes. Now apparently there are some real uh, challenges in training pilots even getting runways to be adaptable in Ukraine. Was this idea a failure? Did we finally say yes at one point? We should have said no. Well, I mean, I think what you saw there was a desire to essentially, you know, this was something that Vladimir Zelensky really wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a real numbers game, obviously, the question of pilots. Uh, so the number of pilots you would be training, it's a pretty small number in Ukraine. You have language issues. These guys would be flying a system mm -hmm. uh, and working with trainers who are speaking English when they may not speak English. Um, and then just the broader term issue of, well, what's this going to look like? How long is this going to take? And, and how many planes are you actually going to be able to get up in the air to make a difference? And right now, it's one of these things that, you know, the, the time lag is so long. I mean, you're looking at years to get these jets in operation over Ukraine, and then you'd be talking about a small number. So it's a big investment uh, for not a lot of show. Well, and if we're talking over the span of years, a lot could change within the right. course of just the next year, including potentially who the president of the United exactly. States is. How much should we expect to hear from NATO members about their plans for an, uh, the potential of a Trump 2.0. How much uh, will that dominate the conversation this week? Well, I mean, it's it's a great question because there is no question that it is one of the biggest things on everybody's mind, essentially, aside from Joe Biden's age. But there is also no question that they really do not want to be talking about it or or they will be talking about it in a way that they they don't acknowledge it. So you have Canada coming and saying, OK, we're going to offer our path to the, the appropriate level of defense spending, you know, two percent of GDP. Uh, we're going we're gonna to tell you how we're going to get there. We're not there yet, but we want to get there. That is something that's really aimed at appeasing Republicans, Donald Trump, who say, listen, everybody in NATO needs to be spending that amount. So you're going to see a lot of Trump proofing slash Trump orientation in anticipation of him coming. But this is not something I mean, I'd be shocked if you hear any one of the 30 or so NATO leaders who are in town actually say his name publicly. They're just not going to do it. Isn't that something? We're going to spend a little time later this hour with the foreign minister of Latvia. Mm. What does a successful summit look like to her? Uh, well, the Latvians, like like the the Baltic countries, they, they want Ukraine uh, to get far more guarantees. Mm -hmm. They want they want a much more robust path for, for Ukraine to get to NATO. And they also want NATO to make very firm commitments about protecting the eastern flank because Baltic countries fear that if Vladimir Putin starts to look beyond Ukraine, the first place he's going to look is to them. Yeah. So uh, th th what we are hearing so far is that Baltic countries are not especially with ha happy with the language that's coming out of this one. They feel that leaders have not budged sufficiently to offer the guarantees that Ukraine wants. I mean, they are certainly an outlier in the, in the overall sentiment of, of what NATO feels toward Ukraine, but uh, they're not happy right now. Even as Europe has stepped up, contributions. 
what will we hear on that front? Um, well, I mean, again, what you're seeing is a lot of a lot of dispute between the fact that there are some countries like the Baltics that want more financial commitments. Obviously, yeah. they don't have the kind of money that the U.S. and Germany and the U.K. have uh, against countries, the big countries, the U.S., the U.K., Germany, not wanting to commit long term. I mean, that's what NATO really wants. That the, the Jens Stoltenberg, the outgoing Secretary General, he wants long-term commitments from all these countries basically to move well beyond Trump and, and offer those guarantees to Ukraine. They do not want to offer that. So I, I expect you'll see some financial commitments, but certainly not in the tens or twenties of billions of dollars that Ukraine would want. All right, Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams, who Thank leads you, our national security coverage. Thank you so much. Setting the stage for us. Great primer on this first day of the NATO summit here in Washington. And as we spoke with Nick about, it comes at a time of great domestic question for the United States and President Biden as he gets set to speak at NATO later this afternoon, just about four hours from now is when he is expected as lawmakers on the Hill debate whether he should meet be the Democratic nominee as they return. We're joined now by one of them, I'm pleased to say, live from Capitol Hill, Congressman Brad Sherman of California. The Democrat is with us now. Congressman, we do want to talk to you as you sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee about NATO and, and some other matters as well. But of course, there was a caucus meeting with you and your colleagues this morning. Did any consensus about the future of Biden as the nominee emerge from that meeting or did it just create more confusion? We had a consensus that uh, Biden has been an outstanding president. Biden had a bad night. Trump has had, led a bad life. As to what we should do now, uh, I won't say that, you know, we're a Democratic Party. We've got a lot of different views. Some uh, thought that no matter what, Biden should be our nominee and it shouldn't be discussed. Others thought we ought to urge Biden uh, to, uh, to drop out. I took kind of a midpoint. I think that uh, the delegates will make the best possible decision if Biden provides more tests and uh, more information. We'll see that in the press conference he's going to do in a couple of days. I would like to see him for 90 minutes live at 9 p.m. Uh, in the next couple of weeks because on September 10th, he's got his second debate with Trump, which will be 90 minutes live at 9 p.m., and uh, it's important that the delegates have a chance to see him perform under a similar circumstance. This isn't an endless conversation, uh, obviously, Congressman, and I can hear your support for Joe Biden here. While I realize you want to see more, how much time uh, is there for Democrats? Is it between now and the convention in Chicago, or are we looking at a couple of weeks here, knowing that we've got issues potentially getting on ballots and so forth, if it's not going to be Joe Biden at the top of the ticket? I think it's clear that we can get on all the ballots if we act uh, at the time of our convention. Ohio was an outlier. They've changed their rules. So although we were planning to meet uh, Ohio's requirements by having a virtual vote in early August, uh, we can now do this on August 20th. And that is a, a, that will work for all 50 states. As so a he's political got a month. Matter, the convention is the deadline. Yes, and yet I think we'll be making a decision, a, a collective decision long before then. Uh, and it's, uh, it's Im I, I think, important that we see uh, before the convention that Biden can meet that test of September 10th when he debates Trump a second time. What we have heard from the president, Congressman, is a suggestion or a pushback against polling that suggests he is lagging behind Donald Trump in a meaningful way, or perhaps that has widened since his debate performance at the end of last month. Do you believe what you're seeing in the polls? Well, uh, it takes a while for a major event to really register with the public and really be reflected in the polls. And so I think it's polls for a few days from now that will reflect uh, what happened uh, on, on June 27th. Uh, but I don't think anybody would say that the uh, debate performance helped the Biden campaign. And uh, uh, we, I, I, I think a similar performance on September 10th uh, would be a, a big problem. And that's why I think we need uh, our presidential candidate, the leader of our party, to demonstrate that in the words of Nancy Pelosi, uh, that was an episode, not a condition. I think he can meet that test. Uh, I prefer the test to be as close as possible to the one he'll face on September uh, uh, September 10th. Uh, but uh, there'll be a number of ways in which he demonstrates uh, to the delegates who are the ultimate decision makers here 
uh, that uh, he uh, is uh, is fully up to the job, not only of beating Donald Trump, not only of beating him in the debate, but also in governing this country uh, until the end of the second term. Well, as a Democrat who has not yet made up his mind on this or, or found common ground with colleagues in the House and from your perch on the Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman, what are you looking for when Joe Biden speaks at the NATO summit today at five o'clock? What do you want to hear? What spirit do you expect him to bring to the podium? Uh, I want him to deal with tough questions that he may not have anticipated and uh, to acquit himself uh, well. Uh, I am very sure that his policies toward NATO will be uh, reasonable and ones that I would generally support. Uh, so I'm not looking at that press conference in terms of uh, is does he have the right views about our foreign policy? I'm looking at that press conference to right. see whether uh, he can uh, uh, convince the country that uh, that one debate was just an episode. OK, so if you're not looking for policy, Congressman, others might be. Is there a tangible outcome you would like to see from the NATO summit this week as it pertains to Ukraine or anything else? Well, I think we need European countries and Canada to step forward and meet that 2% commitment. Uh, the majority of NATO countries have done that, but most of that majority are the smaller countries with the smaller gross national products. We need to see Germany and France uh, step forward. We need to see Canada step forward and, uh, and spend more on their, uh, their own defense. Uh, they uh, used to think that they're on a totally safe continent. That is clearly not the case. What do you make of all this talk of Trump-proofing NATO, Congressman, and the idea of European nations looking to stand up their own armies, possibly an EU army, in a world in which the United States is no longer leading uh, as the tip of the spear in this alliance? Is that a conversation that you're allowing? I think that if they spend the money, and uh, particularly on equipment, and develop their own military forces, that the NATO command structure will uh, will work well. Uh, I, I think that if uh, there there are so many reasons for Europe uh, to be able to do more, maybe one of those reasons is that under a Trump administration, America would do less. Hmm. It's great to have you, Congressman, weigh in on that, given your seat on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Just in our final moment with you, knowing you also sit on House Financial Services, what's your top question for Fed Chair Jerome Powell when he testifies before you tomorrow? Well, the big issue here was his uh, testimony today that they're going to completely revise and republish the mm -hmm. uh, Basel III banking regulations. Too many of our regulations push the banks to put their money on Wall Street and not to make those small loans to uh, businesses on Main Street. And uh, we, need, uh, we need bank regulations that don't unfairly discriminate in favor of, uh, of buying billion dollars uh, bond portfolios and instead push the banks to their traditional role of making loans in local cities. Great to have you back, Congressman. We'll be watching and listening. That hearing starts 10 a.m. tomorrow as Jay Powell moves to the House side. Brad Sherman of California with The View from a Democrat in the middle of this conversation today, Kaylee, pretty interesting. That was a private meeting that we were talking to him about. No cameras or microphones. Yeah, just a lot of questions for reporters who are mm -hmm. out there sweating in the heat as lawmakers emerged. And as the congressman suggested, doesn't seem like they emerged with one idea of whether or not yeah. Joe Biden should continue. I think we got a nominee. TBD on that yeah. one. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. We have a few top stories and to some extent they are related as one pertains to the future of President Joe Biden as the Democratic nominee in this 2024 election cycle. The other pertains to something else on his plate this week, which is the NATO summit that is being held here in Washington. He will be speaking at that summit less than four hours from now, Joe. Yeah, we'll bring you some of his remarks uh, to get a sense of how it's going. I don't know if he's going to make a lot of news today, Kaylee. This is kind of the opener. But every time Joe Biden is in front of a camera, it's a moment here. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of the world that we're in. Just hours after House Democrats met 
on this matter. You were hearing us discuss it earlier. There doesn't appear to be, following our conversation with Congressman Sherman, any consensus moving forward. Everyone's in a wait-and-see mode, and I suspect that goes for our panel as well. Adam Hodge is with us today, Democratic strategist, uh, managing director of the Bully Pulpit International and a veteran of the National Security Council in the Biden administration, joined by Lester Munson, of course, Republican strategist back with us from BGR Group. It's great to have both of you with us here. Adam, this is another test today, as we've been seeing for Joe Biden. But coming off of that conversation we just had with Congressman Sherman, is this good news or bad news when you hear a California Democrat saying, I support Joe Biden, but we haven't found consensus yet? I think there's no question that the president has had a good 24 hours. And if you look at where the conversation was leading into this weekend, I don't think what you heard from Brad Sherman there was what you would have heard of if we didn't have the last 24 okay. hours from the Biden campaign. Um, the president has been forceful. He's been clear about what his vision and what his record is. He has to maintain that for the next 119 days um, to prove to the voters why he should be the Democratic nominee. Only he can do that, and that's the task at hand mm -hmm. for the, this week, certainly with NATO, but also leading into the Democratic convention and then at the debate in September through Election Day. Well, Lester, considering the concerns about the president's age and mental acuity seem to be so pervasive at this point, how far could one speech this evening at NATO or one press conference later on this week that we're expecting Thursday go to, to erasing some of those concern? Or is it going to take more than just a few good moments to erase the bad ones? I think it's going to it's going to take more than a few, Kaylee. Uh, the speech today, I don't think is going to push things one way or, the, or another, uh, absent some dramatic event, uh, because he'll be likely reading off a teleprompter and he, he can do OK in that kind of situation. Uh, the press conference later this week is a little more interesting. Is he going to get some unexpected questions? You know, the White House has been the staff have been hit for trying to manage these things a little too closely. Um, can they have a, a freewheeling event and can the president be in the moment and be fully responsive and give clear and complete answers? That, that would be a nice step forward for him. Uh, but he's going to again, he's going to have to do that consistently for the next four months. A lot of questions about uh, the president's relationship with his doctor and whether he was uh, seeking some th sort of therapy for something more than just getting old. Parkinson's came up a number of times in the White House press briefing yesterday, and his doctor had to issue a letter last night, two pages long, to clarify. I want to bring it back to the White House briefing room yesterday, Karine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, and a back and forth with reporters on this. Was this expert's visit, was multiple visits to the White so, House and pertaining at all to the president? Well, here's the thing. I have I've said he's he has had three he has th had three, uh, three physicals. In those three physicals, that's when he has seen a specialist, a, neuro a well, neurological a specialist. specialist. I cannot speak to every person because there are act there's actually a security reasons to protect their privacy. We respect and protecting uh, people's privacy, so do not want to share. Uh, I'm not going to share people's names from here. Very basic, direct question. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on, hold on, wait, 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 wait a second. Eight wait. times, or at least once, in regards to I the just, president wait, specifically. Hold on a Not second. What you should be able to answer by this point. Wait, no, 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 no. No, wait a minute. Come, Ed, please. A little respect here. That's Ed O'Keefe, our, our colleague at CBS News, from the briefing room yesterday. So we go to a two page letter from the doctor, Kevin O'Connor, who visited the White House. He said, Kevin Kennard visited the White House several times over the last year. This is the neurology consultant to the White House Medical Office, and he apparently holds neurology clinics at the White House for active duty military members. This is difficult for people to start getting through their heads here. Exactly who's coming, who's going? Did he see a neurologist? Does he have Parkinson's? You know, there's something about if you're explaining, you're losing, I think, is the line. Is the White House communications office, the press office, up to this? Look, I think what you heard from the White House last night is that the president has seen a neurologist, mm -hmm. the words very, were very careful, a neurologist at each physical. I, having been in the White House medical unit, yes. having seen people who've come in and gone out of that room, there are a lot of experts and who treat a, a lot of active duty and reservists who work at the White House. Mm -hmm. There's an act, I mean, That's he, important for he is the commander in chief. Let's not forget that. Sure. There are, he has military aides who are with him all the time and they also get care mm -hmm. 
through the White House Medical Unit. The doctor was very clear like th that they said he saw the neurologist one time for each of the physicals that he's had over the last few years. And each of those visits, they determined and did an assessment, and they determined he did not have Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. That's what the doctor, I mean, he's a, he's a doctor. He sure. has the medical oath that he has to follow, and he has made clear that that's not the president's diagnosis. And so I think what you saw yesterday was the White House not quite able to speak to the full breadth of what the, Dr. Uh, Kennard, I think his name, That's right. uh, what his full scope of work is there. Mm -hmm. They then got that clarity and informed the public. That's what you saw last night. Well, I guess it becomes a question of knowing the intensity around of the scrutiny into Joe Biden and his, his mental and physical health right now. Is it not a moment in which the White House or the campaign needs to be embracing a kind of radical transparency? There's been a lot of talk about taking a cognitive test for yes, both right. Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Would it not behoove President Biden as a candidate who wants to be elected for another four years, go deeper into his 80s in the meantime, to just say, all right, fine, I will do it. I will put the questions to bed. My understanding is that the, neuro the neurological exam that as part of his physical is more robust than a cognitive test. Mm -hmm. So. I take that as I'm not a doctor. Sure. Neither the three of us are doctors, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take that from what, what, I, what I read and what I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what is clear that the president should do over the next 119 days is everything they can to dispel this idea that the president is unfit to serve another four years. And so like Congressman Sherman said, it's a good idea. The White House can have him do more press conferences in prime time. Also will help prep for the debate in September. Mm -hmm have a great speech at the convention, do all, all those steps to show the American public that what you saw from Joe Biden over the last 24 hours is what you can expect throughout the rest of the campaign and in the next four years. That's his job. Lester, I don't know if you read the New York Times this morning. I don't know if you go near the New York Times, but James Carville is writing an op-ed today. And man, it's a doozy. Uh, he says that Joe Biden is not going to be the nominee. Mark my words, the top line. Biden is not going to be the nominee will be out of the 2024 presidential race, whether he is ready to admit it or not. And he's proposing a new approach here. Forget all those people in the White House. Carville calling for a super democratic process, as he names this, to choose the nominee, starting with four regional town halls moderated by former presidents Obama and Clinton. I don't know what James Carville uh, had with dinner last night, Lester, but what would happen? If that took place, <laughs> well, uh, boy, talk about the the clash of egos. Um, this is, it's pretty spectacular. Say no more. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I I I did see that piece. Uh, I do like the New York Times most of the time. Uh, I think <laughs> I think Carville is probably correct. Uh, this again, common sense tells us this: uh, the condition of the president is only going in one direction, and and he can. You know, as much as uh, the White House staff, God bless them, they're doing their jobs, are trying to offer some spin and some cover and explanations, uh, people see what is happening. They saw it uh, very clearly during the debate. Uh, the president really, he's going to have to be flawless going forward here if he's going to if he's going to stay in this position and be at all competitive with Donald Trump mm -hmm. in November. That's the real issue. And I think James Carville, I'm I'm old enough to remember uh, when he was only middle age um, and, and a pretty good <laughs> campaign uh, consultant uh, for Bill Clinton. Uh, he really cares about the Democratic Party and about defeating Donald Trump. And that's where this is coming from. And so I think we should, the, the mechanics may not be perfect for what he's describing, but the sentiment I think is spot on. Adam, you want to quickly weigh in on this? We've got about 30 Super seconds left. Super democratic process. <laughs> I mean, I think the chances of Barack Obama stepping into an event like that are virtually zero. I think he has shown he has no interest in, in stepping into that. I think Lester raises a, a good point uh, about where the Democratic Party is. We've got to figure out, and Joe Biden has to make the case of why he should be the Democratic nominee. If he does that, if he decides he's the nominee, then Democrats have to unite behind him. All right, Adam Hodge, Democratic strategist and managing director at Bully Pulpit International. Thank you so much for joining us today alongside Republican strategist Lester Munson, who is the co-head of the international practice at the BGR Group. While we've been talking about the Democratic nominee and where the delegates ultimately are going to go, political reporting now, mm -hmm. Joe, Nikki Haley <laughs> releasing her 97 delegates and telling them to vote for Donald Trump Just like at that. the convention. So much for Next a contested week. convention in Milwaukee. We'll find out about <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.